Welcome to the Creating Well Simplified Podcast. My name is Lauren Wells, here with my co-host, Chris Seveny. We're committed to providing you with the knowledge required to build wealth through real estate investing. Tired of consuming content about real estate? Stuck in analysis paralysis? Ready to do your first deal? As a member of our community, you will learn how to go from consuming content to taking that first step into the world of real estate investing. Our show is not about getting rich quick, but about providing you with the knowledge you need to take action. Join us as we speak with experienced investors who share action tips on how to escape the corporate world, start a thriving side hustle in the world of real estate, and go beyond your W-2 or 401k. Welcome everybody to the Creating Wealth Simplified podcast, where each week we bring you education and information that will help you take your next step in building wealth through real estate. My name is Lauren Wells. I am your host. And today I am joined by the lovely Shanoa Groves. So welcome, Shanoa. So happy to have you. Hey, Lauren. Glad to be here. Yeah. So Shanoa is a fourth generation Texas real estate investor who started investing in 2003 and went full time in 2004. She has done over a thousand real estate deals. And as a result of her knowledge and success, she hasn't had to rely on taking a paycheck from anyone else since 2003. Uh, Shanoa joined her local real estate investing association in 2003 as well, and eventually purchased the association in 2008 and has grown it significantly since then. And in as part of that has helped train over 87,000 real estate investors on how to complete creative real estate transactions that work in every part of the market cycle. So I was telling you, Chanel, earlier, I don't feel like that does you enough justice. Uh, we met at Quest and you are a force and seem to, you know, everyone wants to gravitate towards you. And yeah, I mean, tell us a little bit about kind of yourself. What got you started in real estate? Yeah, so although I am a fourth generation real estate investor, I am of the age, and I'm sure most people who are listening here as well, of the generation of people that said, I want you to go to college, right? I want you to go and pursue an advanced degree. I want you to go and get a job. So in spite of the fact that my great-grandparents invested, my grandparents invested, my parents still own over a dozen doors to this day that in some cases they've had since the 90s, right? Uh, They encouraged me to go to school. And I thought, well, all right, I'm going to do this. And I'm going to show you guys how income is made and how wealth is made. I'm going to show you how this (laughs) stuff gets done. Uh, I was kind of a redhead stepchild at that time in, in a way. And uh, I went uh, yeah, into, uh, I finished my degree, finished my undergrad, got my MBA, and I started working in corporate America. And when I was in school, I kind of jokingly referred to my mom as this is my mom, the slumlord. And when I was in corporate America, I had to change the way that I introduced her to this is my mom, the millionaire, actually the multimillionaire as a result of what she did in real estate and real estate investing. And as I changed the way that I introduced her, there was this lump that just kind of went down my throat, just kind of swallowing a little bit of pride there (laughs) of like, oh yeah, okay, they were right. Uh, But um, right about that time, my husband lost his job. So he got fired. And um, he had been in high tech for about 20 years, uh, working at several different uh, semiconductor companies and uh, several different startups uh, over the years as well. And he was looking at all different sorts of uh, different businesses to be able to buy or to be able to start. And he really got hooked on investing in real estate, investing in real estate. And he said to me, Shanoa, you're going to be, you know, coming along for the ride with me. And I'm like, oh, you know, I think I might be good. You know, I just part of it was I had this identity as, you know, being in corporate America, I had this identity of going and getting an education and, you know, being this person. And it was a little difficult for me to say that I was ready to exit that identity and exit corporate America and exit, you know, the, the blankie that was, you know, uh, checking your, checking your uh, account every two weeks, insurance, other benefits, et cetera. And it, you know, and, and, and I'm, I I love to work uh, something I very much enjoy. So uh, as I got started, I was doing it on the side. And um, at some point I realized, wow, I'm making more money just doing this on the side than I am in my full-time job. And the, you know, the company that I was with was 
you know, kind of had barely survived dot com boom and bust and was just kind of like hanging on like by the by the fingernails. And I thought, oh, for sure, they're going to fire. They've been firing like over half of the company. And I'm like, oh, for sure, they're going to fire me. So at least on the way out, I'll get a severance package. But <laughs> I was like one of the ones that they were like, don't go, hang on, you know, stay with us. And I'm like, I can't, I just, I can't anymore. And um, I went uh, full time uh, uh, in 2004 and I've never had to update my resume since then. Uh, I haven't had to take a paycheck from anyone else since then. And it feels really fantastic as I'm going into, so in a couple of days, it'll be my 19th year anniversary. So I'm going into my 20th year, um, actually tomorrow. Uh, so it's going to be kind congrats. of exciting. Early it's congrats. Been, yeah, it's been a really fun and wonderful journey. And it has um, it has uh, been one that's helped me create an incredible amount of income and wealth, uh, which is one of the beautiful things about investing in real estate and an incredible amount of freedom, uh, both financial freedom, time freedom, which is probably the thing that I value most now. And uh, something that I'm so glad that I uh, made, I, I exited from, you know, what I will call my identity at that time yeah. and haven't looked back since. And I'm so happy to do what I do. And I'll tell you when I first started investing, it was all about money, right? So it's all, all about like, I've got to create income. I've got to create wealth. I didn't have 401k anymore. And also wanted to live in really, you know, awesome, wonderful houses. Yeah. And um, so, you know, at first I was just very singularly focused and, and, and then I realized, wow, as I'm working with many of these people, I'm really being of service being creative, uh, using several different strategies to be able to buy and sell houses. So for me, I know how to make money, whether a house has 100% equity or whether the house has little, no, or negative equity. So I basically, over the years, have figured out how to make money every single time the phone rings, which is one of the things that has kept me recession-proof and has allowed me to not have to go up and redo my resume. Uh, so at this point in my life and my, my career, my resume is in some version of DOS, you know, that even the techies <laughs> and the techie people couldn't resurrect. And I wouldn't want you to because I love what I do in investing. And it went from creating income and wealth to, wow, I'm really helping a lot of people along yeah. this journey. And then it's kind of also blossomed into uh, training, coaching, mentoring. So not only do I get to help myself and help the people that I individually, uh, that I buy and sell from, but I also get yeah. to help the people who I personally coach and our, we have a, our group coaches. So what that looks like for me is watching them be successful is like, oh, how this, this feels really fantastic and amazing. And then knowing that they're going out and touching lives as well, it just feels like life has kind of come completely full circle. Sure. And, you know, now when people, you know, ask me, you know, what I do, right. Uh, for a living, you know, I've got, I've got two things that I typically say uh, that I do. So number one, when I'm, you know, buying is I turn unrelenting, unwilling, unconvertible, uncontractable, unclosable homeowners <laughs> into motivated sellers. And I do it all on unachievable timelines, all while solving unsolvable problems, right? And then as a real estate investor who also helps other people as they're getting started, uh, I get to help people quit jobs that they hate so that they can do things that they love, enhance their own lives and the lives of others. And it feels amazing. And for me, it's just uh, been part of my mission, part of my purpose to be able to touch those lives and just kind of watch those tentacles grow out and, and affect the lives of others. And, and now, you know, for the students who work with me personally, um, I know that I've done my job when I get to collect their, their, their badge you know, their, their badge from when they uh, log into work and they open a door into work. So oh, I asked them, it's like, when you, when you quit your job, like I want your badge because like my dream is to have a Christmas tree full of everyone's badges that I have helped, you know, quit, quit their jobs, change their lives, spend time with, yeah. with the people that they love when they want, want to do them. And, you know, the issue, the only problem I've encountered with doing that is, is, is that the first thing they ask you for when you leave your job is that badge. <laughs> So either I'm going to have to have this, you know, dumpy, tiny little Charlie Brown style Christmas tree, or I'm just going to have to work harder and longer and I'm in, I'm in for the ride. So uh, it's been, it's been a blast for me. Um, it's been incredibly rewarding for me and yeah. Uh, yeah, just really wonderful. I love that. And I feel like that resonates a bit with me too. I'm the oldest of three girls and whenever anyone asks about my real estate journey, it's the same. I was like, my family did real estate but wanted me to go to college and 
then I was like, well, I'm going to do my own thing. Like, I don't need to do what you're going to do. I'm going to make my own way. So Mm -hmm. I did like the tech, the corporate Silicon Valley sales that lived that life only to look back at my younger sister who was like, "Ah, I'm going to stick with real estate and be like, wow, that was the smarter move. Like (laughs) as you grow a family, as you realize your time is so valuable, I'm like, hmm, so much for being stubborn and oldest and all of that. So it resonates with me a little bit when to hear you say that kind of went through that journey. And, um, you know, how, like you said, you said something about how, when you first started out, it was about making that income. Cause obviously you wanted to live and have your time and live in this houses. And how did you, I guess, what were, what were some of your first investments? What was like, what was your first deal? Yeah. Um, you know, as being a part of a family of real estate investors, uh, what it was, was I, uh, when I was in college, um, my mom said to me, Shanoa, you can't, you can't rent, right? You've got to own because we're a family of owners. We're not a family of renters. And so, uh, from that standpoint, you know, she's like, she's like, okay, let's go find a house for you. And at the time, um, there was still a, uh, a loan product called a non-qualifying assumable loan. So non-qualifying assumable loan is how a college kid with uh, really no income to speak of. Uh, so at the time, and I don't want you to get jealous, Lauren, but at the time <laughs> I was making $4 and 75 cents an hour American. Right? <laughs> so I, and I, you know, it was, it was, I was 20 and um, uh, so it didn't have really any savings. So the way that we bought that house is, um, on a non-qualifying assumable loan. So they don't issue any of those loans anymore. They stopped issuing those uh, in the 90s. And, and we bought that property in the um, uh, in the early mid 90s. Uh, so now the way that we buy is we buy subject to. So it's similar process, maybe t- basically taking over someone's loan, uh, but goes by a slightly different name, right? So uh, buying subject to. So for, for me, that was my first house that I that I got into. And then after that, um, I, you know, I, you know, I went to college, I, you know, I was finished college and then I went back to get my MBA and then I was working in corporate America. So I basically put my real estate investing on hold, but, uh, and, and it wasn't until I turned 30 that I got back into investing. And I'll tell you that that first house that, uh, my mom and I bought together, uh, it's still in our family. So when we bought it, it was like, uh, we paid $105,000 for it today. It's easily worth you know, somewhere between 1.6 and $1.8 million and it's still in our family. So that's kind of a, a proof point to buy it and hold on no matter what happens. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, so that was, that was the first investment. And that was also part of the, what, you know, what made me say, like, look back and say, am I creating as much wealth in my corporate career as I am? And, you know, just this one investment that I kind of dabbled in when I was in college and um, after that, you know, as Phil and I started to invest together, uh, uh, I've bought houses to be moved. I have uh, bought many houses subject to, I've wholesaled a lot of properties. Um, I, I obviously keep a lot of rental properties because I know that that is a foundation of wealth and building wealth, holding those over the long time. You know, one of my coaches very on taught me that the people who make money, the people who get rich and build wealth in real estate are the ones that can afford to hold on to properties in between market cycles, right? So you have to have the capital to be able to hold on. And, you know, especially in a market like we're in right now, for those folks who are watching, who are listening, watching, uh, who are just getting started, uh, cash is king, right? It's like we're in this, we're in this simultaneous era right now where, you know, on one hand, cash is trash because of inflation. And on the other hand, cash is king because of liquidity to be able to hold on to a pro- uh, product or a project in between market cycles, right? No, so uh, that's, 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 that's sort of one of the um, uh, 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 dances that we're having to do as real estate investors. We never want to be too cash rich and too equity poor or, or asset poor. And we never want to be too asset rich and too cash poor, right? There's there's always wow. this balance. Um, and, and that balance is the thing that's actually going to help you survive and thrive no matter uh, what the market throws at you. So, you know, I, I, I kind of describe my career, you know, it's like I've invested through multiple presidents, Mm-hmm. multiple, you know, law changes, multiple contract changes, 
uh, 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 the, you know, I got started in the dot-com bus. That's when I cut my teeth, right. In real estate investing, yeah. I've invested through the great recession. I've invested through, you know, that credit boom right bef yeah. before that I've invested through the last 10 years, which has been the best 10 years ever. I've invested through a pandemic. I've invested through hurricanes, tornadoes, you know, ice storms, uh, snow storms. Uh, you're in California. So I haven't invested through wallflowers. <sighs> Wild Wild not yeah. word, I don't have to. No one can get insurance anymore anyway. So don't, I don't recommend it. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, a little about my journey. Yeah. So you've, I mean, you've, you've invested in down markets, you've invested in great markets. You know, I would say, what are some of the lessons that you've learned? Not necessarily that were correlated to the market, but just in general, what were some like hard, maybe lessons you learned the hard way or some fails that you had mm -hmm. to show that it wasn't always, I feel like people get this idea that it's like, oh, I went from, you know, one house under contract to a multifamily of 200 at overnight. And it's this grand success. Cause that's all we see on social media. Yeah. We don't really see like the valleys people went through and you know, what they maintain to get to where they are. So I guess, tell us about some hits you took or some yeah, losses. Sure. So, happened. um, you know, when, when we first started investing, because I mean, you know, what's interesting is you know, my first loan was about the same interest rate as the loans that they are giving out today. I right? know. So I, know. Like, so I know it's, I, you know, and, and sometimes I feel like I'm, you know, Anne Boleyn, you know, oh, let, them eat, <laughs> let them eat cake, you know, it's like, and I have to realize that it's perspective, right? So, you know, for me, it's like, yeah, no, I've been through this. It's all good. But for someone who's not a full cycle investor, it's, it's, um, um, it can unhinge you, right. Yeah. And, and cause can cause a lot of, you know, trouble and frustration. So, you know, for me, you know, one of the things that, um, uh, a colleague of mine taught me very early on was that, you know, your job, my job as an entrepreneur is to look for the disruption in the marketplace and come up with a solution for that disruption, put a process and system around it, hand it to somebody else to do for you while you're looking and working on the next disruption. And, you know, so for us getting started in the dot-com bust um, and, and working in a community where there was a lot of tech, um, so we're kind of in, um, you know, the part of Texas is kind of like the sister Silicon Valley. And, the, you know, a lot of the first deals that I did were short sales, right? So, uh, you know, I found all of these people were getting, having some decrease in income and or increase in expense getting laid off. And so I did a ton of short sales. And at the time, you know, when I got started, banks were doing their job, which was lending, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, in 2009, 10, 11, it's like, well, we got to do, we got to do more short sales again, but the banks stopped doing their job, which was lending. So I had a seller who was, uh, you know, a motivated seller. I had a buyer who was a motivated buyer, but I didn't have the glue in the middle, which was the bank, you know, who was, you know, put, you know, putting the haves and wants together. So for a long time, you know, I kind of, you know, hit my head against the wall. Right. So I, you know, I just thought, oh, this is easy. I'll just, you know, I got this. I'm just going to work hard. Right. This is just part of my DNA. And it was all I was doing is just hitting my head. You know, it's like I had all of these short sales and then I didn't have any buyers for them. Right. So, so at some point I realized that, you know, the disruption is not that there's not sellers because there are a ton of sellers, not that there are not buyers because there are a ton of buyers, but the glue in the middle. So probably it took me about six months before I was able to uh, pull myself away from kind of that old thinking and then put myself in today's and, and, and that time yeah. that times thinking and be able to come up with a solution. So where I was basically wrapping it, you know, getting a property subject to that normally an investor wouldn't touch, meaning a seller with little, yeah. no, or negative equity and finding a buyer who didn't care about the equity position, just cared that they could get the house, yeah. right? So um, and maybe a, a lender or a, bo a borrower who couldn't get a traditional loan just because of a credit score, because of, you know, a, a past hiccup, but had the money, had the down payment. And, as you know, you get this willing seller, you get this willing buyer and through the magic of subject two and a wraparound mortgage. Uh, and having the skill set to do that, I got yeah. to take part in some of that buyer's down payment. And the seller was thrilled and relieved because number one, they didn't have to do a short sell. And number two, they didn't have to lose their property to foreclosure. But it took us a while to realize that, hey, this is what we're going to have to do to be able to survive, you know, uh, what was probably the longest great recession that we've ever lived through, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's like a normal recession 
is usually only about two years, right? If you look, you know, yeah. what, you know, 2008 right. was, it we didn't get out of it for most uh, markets until um, January of 2012, right? So yeah. that was about, you know, three and a half years, four years. So, uh, and then, you know, during that time frame, just because the market took a 30% haircut in terms of the number of sales, there was an asset, um, uh, I can't even tell you the, I, I don't even want to mention the name of the street because it makes my little heart break. Uh, but it was an asset that we had to sell. And if we had held on to it for, you know, another five, six years, we probably could have sold it for double what we sold it for and probably could have made an extra million dollars on it. So that was a little heartbreaking. Uh, but, you know, you, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's like cash is king. We had to get, keep the cash coming in to stay liquid for all of the other things that were going on in that market. And, um, you know, so, so, you know, what that taught me is to be able to survive, you know, a recession, you know, even if it is un uncomfortable, you're looking at a lot of cash in your bank, um, especially when it's a high inflationary environment, know that that cash is going to um, make sure that you service your debt, uh, make sure that you don't have to sell anything that you don't want to sell. And also give you the ability to be, you know, nimble in a market where great opportunities come up, which are down markets, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so, and, you know, for me, knowing that the average recession is only two years long, and I can't even say that we're in a recession right now, just if you look at unemployment numbers, they're still so high. If you look at job creation, it's well, still yeah. so high. Yeah. So, and the, the people that are getting hit with, you know, being late with layoffs, it's that tech industry. But that's yeah. not, that's a byproduct of them spending outside their means because money was so cheap. Yeah. yeah. So it's not yeah. as a whole. Yeah. The, the jobs don't look that bad. It's that one industry, which I think people see that because they see, oh my gosh, Facebook, oh my gosh, you know, these big companies are laying off, but it's because the money was so cheap for them to raise that they didn't, it's a kind of like, they didn't really plan ahead for this possibility of this happening. So I agree with you. I think that we might be headed, we are headed there, I think, but um, I don't think we're there yet. Yeah, I, I agree. It's it's going to be one of the weirdest recessions we've ever had. I mean, 2008 had all the markings of a typical recession, but 2022, 2023 uh, doesn't, doesn't, right? So number one marketing marking mark is reduction in, in employment um, or unemployment going up. Like, you know, I want to say it was in the nine to 10% range in 2008, nine um, versus right now, I think it's like 3.7%. So, you know, it's like, uh, I mean, and that's just like the government calls full employment and an unemployment rate that's below like 6%. So technically we're still fully employed, but the housing market is definitely correcting, right? So yeah. um, in Texas, for example, uh, for most of the markets, we've had a 30% year over year haircut in the total number of sales. Now our average price in Texas is still up somewhere between five to 8%, depending on the market. But, you know, I was just kind of doing the math earlier you know, we've had gone from a 3% interest rate to a 7% interest rate. So we've gone up four, you know, uh, four points in interest rates. Not I think the prices point, would have points. come down more. And well, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're not because of supply, yep. right? So, yep. um, and so I kind of was doing the calculations like, okay, for every 1% increase in interest rates, it's a seven and a half percent drop in total sales. So we're up for, you know, interest rate percentages and our sales are down 30%. So if, uh, Jerome Powell, you know, I know he's, he said he's going into the market now to, or the next uh, increase is only, is probably only going to be a half percent, but then the next one after that will also probably be a half percent. So another 1% might take our sales down 37 and a half percent over the next year over year and a 2%, you know, total increase of going from seven to nine, um, you know, could get us down 45% year over year. 30% down year over year was exactly where we were uh, from our height, you know, from our height to our trough and the great recession. So we're already there in terms of reduction number of sales. Uh, and I think it's probably going to go lower, but the sales prices are still up just because of inventory, right? It's basic supply and demand. Uh, now I will say, you know, one of the tips, you know, for a downturn that you need to watch out for as a new investor is don't just look at days on market. Days on market is, are the, uh, you know, time on market for the lucky ones that actually make it to the finish line. Look at months of inventory instead, because months of inventory 
really represents your full liability as uh, in terms of holding time for a real estate investor. And what's you know a little scary about most months of inventory stats is it's because of the distribution of real estate sales, right? Uh, you know, winter, spring, summer, fall, winter again. Um, it goes back a full year. So we always compare year over year versus month over month. But because months of inventory takes a look at the total sales over the last year, right? It's it, it's it's pulling in sales when we were at the fever pitch all the way up through May of 2022. So months of inventory when the market's going down is actually looks lower than what it actually is. So it's really actually higher than that. So that can be really scary if you're looking at a million dollar investment where, okay, holding time days on market might only be, you know, 60 days, but your total competition, if you calculate all that in using months of inventory, it might be six months, it might be nine months. And that's why I said having that liquidity is really key right now because the way the markets go up is it takes the escalator up but it takes the elevator down, right? So it goes down at twice the rate that it goes up, which can be really, you know, scary. Is like there's almost like, okay, well, what price, you know, do I have to price it at to be able to sell them? Well, there not may not be that bottom price, and you know what we're seeing a lot of people transition to, which is we're in a much better state than where we were, uh, for example. In you know 2008, where interest rates were you know seven percent, all, yeah. all of the you know people who refinance refinance in 2020, 2021, 2022, they can afford to sit on these houses and keep them as rental properties, um, and they're cash flowing right versus. In 2008, 9, 10, 11, it's like there were adjustable rate mortgages, there were balloon notes, um, yeah. and then more monthly mortgage payments were above, you know, rent rates. So they were losing cash flow, which for a lot of people is like can't take that, take, can't take that at all. And so they had to sell at the bottom of the market, right? So or short sale or foreclose or whatever it may be. So um, that's those are some of the things that I think um, smart investors should be watching out for. Um, especially in this market when, again, you're taking the elevator down. Um, so it feels like it's happening very quickly. It's like um, Ernest Hemingway uh, has this book, The Sun Also Rises. And he was asking the, one of the um, uh, characters in the book, you know, well, how did you go bankrupt? And the guy said, well, gradually, then all of a sudden, <laughs> it's like, what happened? Again, those escalator up and the yep. elevator down. So you have to really um, be forecasting, really, really good at forecasting your future cash flows in a market like what we're in right now. Yeah. And I think something you pointed out is this is a very different type of recession that we're heading into than 2008, where people, like you said, they've refinanced, they had tons of equity in their home when they refinance. So typically they're probably going to be able to afford those mortgages and sit on them. I just thought that was a really like good point that you made. And then, uh, and they're wearing, you know, it's like, I, all of these people who refinance in 2020, 2021, 2022, you know, they're wearing kind of these invisible golden handcuffs because they really can't sell their house nope. and, and, and do anything other than maybe make a lateral move unless they're saving, you know, another several yeah. hundred thousand dollars to be able to put down. So that is one, of, that is probably one of the biggest saving graces. Uh, there's two really, I think that are uh, out there that's going to really help the uh, housing market have a softer landing. Number one, again, we have all of these homeowners that, you know, would maybe would like to sell, but don't, you know, have to, and then can alternatively rent and don't want to sell these properties because of these golden handcuffs of these, yeah. you know, interest rates. Right. Yeah. And the second thing that I think has really helped us is, is um, it's builders. And I think it's probably even more than builders as it is um, the availability of, 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 of data, right? And so that's, you know, Moore's law, that's technology. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we, you know, I don't think a lot of builders were, you know, looking at months of inventory in 2008, 9, and 10, right? Yeah. And it's like, well, we've started this, so we're building it versus builders today have more, um, you know, have more data to be able to see, okay, what what are the total permits, right? What's coming on board and should I, or should I not be building? And I think, you know, they got, um, you know, they got so hurt in 2008, nine and 10 that they were gun shy already. Um, and, you know, the other kind of saving grace at the same time is just, 
you know, the, the lack of labor, right? So I think builders yeah. would have been way overbuilt if we would have even had the labor to, you know, to be able to do that. But luckily in a way, right, it was, it was not having the labor that partially caused that market to, you know, go up and also those very low interest rates. But now it's like, that's one of the things that I think has, has saved, uh, has saved a lot of builders in my opinion. Yeah. So looking at where we are today, you know, what opportunities, what specific market opportunities do you see for someone who's like, I, you know, I have cash. I don't, I'm real estate is something I'm interested in. I don't know a bunch about it, but I know that's how people make money long-term generational wealth. I want to get started. Are there any like specific asset classes, markets, like specifically that you're like, that's where I have my eyes on. That's what yeah, I mean, for me, you know, when again, we're in the elevator that's going down, you either want to get in projects that you can get in and out of really quickly, mm -hmm. or you want to be in projects that are much longer. So you can be on the upside of that curve. So meaning projects that are you're in and out in less than six months or projects that you are in for at least, for example, two years, which is, you know, just kind of looking forward, the average recession is about two years long, right? So you have to be able to hold on to those things. And, you know, when, you know, we, we saw a lot of what I'll call um, accidental landlords in 2007, eight and nine, it's like, well, I can't really sell it, you know, unless I bring money yeah. to the table, unless I do a short sell. So I'm just going to keep it. I think we're going to have a lot of accidental landlords, you know, who were investors who are fix and flip investors today. So I will say, you know, be nimble in your financing. Um, you know, make sure that 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 you know you have financing options and you know what those are. So, you know, if yeah. you're buying from a hard money lender, typically they want their money back in, you know, six months. And typically they'll do, you yeah. know, one or two extensions, which might give you another, you know, one to six months, depending on how long those extensions are. But you really need to be exploring uh bridge financing. You really need yeah. to be exploring uh whether you can get um uh, uh, capital again to this long-term capital, right. That, so that you can hold it. So I will say just in general, you know, any mistake that you make on the buy by overpaying, uh, or going into a market where it's taking the elevator down, yeah. it, it can be remedied by, you know, again, time and appreciation. You just have to have that cash flow to be able to support that. So, you know, I, I, I uh, was reading in the Wall Street Journal this past weekend that had, had this hashtag, it was hashtag Airbnb bust. So they said that a lot of people who have Airbnb, so the number of Airbnb bookings are higher than they've ever been. But the problem is the supply is also higher than it's ever been. So the result is this delta that on average, most people have a 6% reduction. And that's assuming at this higher level, right? Have a 6% yeah. reduction from what their bookings were last year. But the truth is when your bookings were here, right? Last year as an example, cause your inventory or your bookings were here and your, your inventory was here. My hands may not be doing the right thing. <laughs> as I'm looking at my reflection, but it may feel like to you, like a much bigger hit than a 6% hit, uh, just because it, that 6% over all over every yeah. property, even the new property that's been out there. So, you know, I'm seeing, you know, so many people just get on that bandwagon. And I think that bandwagon is, um, um, that may have already left this, I left the station, you know, a long time ago. And sometimes, when you get into these situations, it's like, you know, you're, you know, you, you made a bad decision six months ago, but you're not going to find that out until another six months. So, yeah. you know, I would say like the people who are looking at Airbnb, that's awesome, but make sure that your property can cash flow on a worst case scenario, which to me, what a worst case scenario looks like is you're just buying it and holding it as a regular rental property, right? If you can't yep. get the bookings. So there's some things that, um, it's kind of some kind of trends I'm seeing and, and some of the trends that I'm reading about, but I think, um, you know, so, you know, you're in California, I'm in Texas. So, um, this is, this is, you know, uh, we have so many people from California migrating to, oh, yeah. migrating to Texas. And you're and, in Austin, right? And I'm in Austin. Yeah, I have Austin. literally like at tons of people from our, my area who, moved out. We, one of the companies I used to work for, put an office there. Yeah. It's I'm so, sure Texas um, is still booming. Yeah, <laughs> one um, book that I have behind me, um, it's called Upside, uh, Profiting from the Profound Demographic Shifts Ahead uh, by Kenneth Gronbeck. And one of the things that he said in here is that 
um, taxes don't redistribute income, taxes redistribute people. Think about that, right? So we're seeing a big redistribu redistribution from high tax states to low tax states. Um, and I think, um, so, so I will say, you know, being in Texas, you know, we have a ton of people, you know, relo relocating here from other high tax. So I think, you know, and even just if you go back to the last, you know, recession, Texas did really well relative to the other, uh, relative to many of the other uh, large states. So yeah. our average sales price was basically flat, took a little dip, but was basically flat yeah. over those four years versus if you look at California, oh, yeah. uh, Florida, um, Arizona, our Nevada, you know, took a 30% plus dip, right? So, Absolutely. you know, in places like that, you see, you know, the, the, the variation, right? It, the, the highs and it is, it is like one of, it's the above 18 year old roller coaster. Versus if you look at the variation in Texas, it's much tighter, right? So it's yeah. kind of in this range. So it's like the, and you know, grand, you can put grandma on this roller coaster, you know, or you can put your kids on this roller coaster, but yeah. you wouldn't want to put, you know, I mean, you wouldn't want to put them on maybe like, a, you know, and I, yeah. I hope this comes here. I know you've got so many folks that are in California, but you know, I, that is the reality of it, right? Yeah. And I mean, California is a beautiful place. The highs are high and the lows are low. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But I, to argue I, that, to kind of play devil's advocate, wouldn't you say that there's more opportunity then to get in on the low in California and make a bigger absolutely. ride that high? Absolutely. Absolutely. The the trouble is, you know, just like you know, any market, you can't you can't tie tie time the market. You know, it's like it's like you know. I mean, but again, as long as you stay in it long enough, you know, you might sell here and it's still going to here, or you might sell here after it was there, right? So, I'll 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 tell you a funny story when when we first started investing and and buying and holding property, we went to the top property manager in town, top property manager in town, and we said, hey, you know, where should we be buying rental? property you've been doing this you know for you know 25 years we're just getting started like you got that it. in and of itself is a great tip for people so anyways continue yeah, yeah so so we went to this top property manager and they said oh well you need to be buying you know this is austin for example you need to be buying yeah. rental properties out here kind of in the suburbs of austin and i said wow you know really why should we you know i, I don't think that was a great area but why tell tell me why we should be buying there yeah. And the property manager said, um, well, because that's where all the rental properties are. And it's like, okay, is there logic in that? I don't, I don't know. Cause like when you're around other, a whole bunch of rental properties, values are typically going down as opposed to going up. Like for me, you know, I always thought I want to be the only rental property in an area of homeowners and they're all improving their property. And yeah. I'm probably the one that looks bad out of all of them in there. And so, you know, we were asking, you know, continuing to kind of uh, talk to him and he was getting a little flustered, annoyed with us at this point, but, you know, we'd asked him, well, well what about, you know, appreciation in this area that's kind of, you know, a suburb of a suburb, if you will. And he, he kind of got a little flustered. And then he said, well, I guess if you're looking for that California style appreciation, yeah, you're not going to find it here. And Phil was like, Phil was like, aren't we all looking for that California <laughs> <appreciation>? <laughs> You know, like, what are you thinking? Yeah. So um, thank God we didn't take his advice. I mean, so, you know, uh, uh, you know, what's worse than trusted advice, trusted advice from, you know, a bad source, right? So that was one of those things where it's like, he was good at maximizing his business, which was uh, managing rental property for owners, but he was not also an, you know, an owner himself owning these properties and kind of seeing, you know, because for all of us, you know, we have this um, cost of capital, but then we have this thing called our opportunity cost of capital, right? So we could have bought in that neighborhood where values were going up like this, or we could have bought in a different neighborhood where values were going up like this. And the thing is, because of compound interest, right? over time, right at the end of that, that's when the values really start to make the big difference between investing in something that's having an average 6% return versus yep. something that's maybe having an above average 10 or 15% return. That compounding over time is really where you need to be uh, really make beautiful choices in terms of the ones that you keep, the ones that are going to build your wealth versus the ones that you say, nope, this is when I'm in and out of very quickly. Do you follow? You know, yeah, no, no, that's good advice. <laughs> okay. Well, it's, it's comes, it comes down to like you said, like the timing, how long are you going to stay in something? 
why would you stay in something longer and kind of being able to walk through that thought process. So I'm curious, you lead your association in Texas um, and you have a huge, like it's a huge group. I mean, it's, I was in Texas when we met and you know, everyone knows Shanoa. If you're in Texas <laughs> and you don't know her, I'm like, who are you? Um, so it's like, tell me a little bit about that and how people become a part of that and what you cover at these things. Cause I'm sure we have, we have people listening in from all over. So I always like to, if people are local to where people were speaking from, then. Yeah, no, absolutely. So we have meetings in Austin, Houston, Dallas, and San Antonio every month. Uh, you can find us by going to Texas RIAs, R-E-I-A-S.com. RIA stands for Real Estate Investor Association. So it's RIAs plural, just because we have uh, several of them. Um, so we meet live uh, every month. We do uh, a coaching tip. So if someone's just getting started or someone's struggling, uh, I actually bring them up to the microphone and I do some live coaching there, which is always fun for me because I never know what they're going to say. Uh, but I know that after doing this for about 20 years, I'm probably going to be able to kind of direct them in the right in the right way. Uh, and then we do a tip of the week every single week. Uh, for example, what's going on in the market, what to be yeah. doing, some of the things that we talked about here as well. Um, every week we do a market update. Uh, so we talk about the different major markets in the tech in Texas, what how they performed last month and what the forecast is for the rest of the year. And then we do a training session on one of the different strategies that we've used to be able to stay unemployable for the last almost two decades. Um, and that's kind of our core uh, meeting, our kind of introductory meeting. And wow. then after that, people will come to a three day training with us uh, to be able to really get um, uh, down into all of the different things that we've learned uh, throughout our investing journey and figure out how they can use that as well. And then some people decide after that, hey, I'd like a little more hand holding from someone who's been doing this and been able to survive and thrive a full cycle uh, investor, um, made it through all the different market cycles. Yeah. And so some of them will go on to do uh, individual coaching and mentoring with myself, my husband, and the rest of our coaching team as well. So, uh, and and you know what I find is. A lot of um, a lot of people who are interested in, in, in investing in Texas, both who you know some of the ones who live here, they'll get attracted like by some of these national you know speakers and stuff. And it's like, well, they can give you this super high level knowledge, but when it comes yeah. down to, I need the name of a contractor, you know, I need the name yeah. of a plumber, of an electrician. I need to know who can give me access to the, you know, to, to the comps. I need to know who, where to close at. I want you to know where I can get the contracts from. You have to get that from local sources, right? So a lot of these national companies will say, I don't know the answer to that. Go to your local RIA. It's like, okay, I'm glad you found us. You know, I'm sorry you had to go through all that other stuff to get yeah. here. Uh, but, you know, we, we're often, you know, that, uh, that stop for people where it's like, okay, now I found a place that has everything that I need, that has the tribal knowledge and is willing to share that tribal knowledge with the rest of the group. So, you know, when I first started investing, as you mentioned, I joined the local real estate investor association and I later, uh, bought it. So I joined it yeah. in 2003, I bought it in 2008, but the rest of that story was I was a five-year volunteer at that association, right? And I and I volunteered and they asked me to volunteer because they could tell like left brain, organized, analytical, okay, you know, have her, have her, have her help, yeah. right? In some way. And um, I got to know everyone in the group, right? So I got to know who had deals. I got to know who had money. I got to know who was real. I get to know who was not. I got to know who had the power team. I got to know who had the strategies. I got to know the right uh, co contractors, the right attorneys, all of that stuff. Yeah. And um, so I, you know, and, and I'll tell you the first deal that I did um, after that one, you know, when I was yeah. uh, in my 20s with my mom, the first deal I did when I got restarted was I got a deal from someone in that group. And the last deal I, I did, I got from someone who was part of that group, right? So this is a group that throws off money, that throws off deals, that throws off partners, uh, that throws off just all of the power team members and really, and, and just the thinking that tribal knowledge in order to, uh, that shared in order to be successful and be able to grow. So I uh, love this group. Um, I continue to carry the torch today, not because I have to, but because it's, it's served me so well. And it is a, um, it is truly a great place to be able to 
um, get that real, you know, the, those local ethical, educated boots on the ground investors from people who have been doing it, as opposed to someone who comes in for one day and then you never see them again. I always joke with the members of the association, you're going to see me again. Well, whether you want to or not, because this is my baby, right? It's like, this is, this is, this is the foundation of my success. And I know it's the foundation of so many other people's success as well. So. Yeah. And that's, you know, I think that power of networking, you know, we have a whole podcast on this, but you know, you purchased this RIA in 2008, like what, what did you, I guess, inherit and how did you make that grow? Like what was your key to success in growing that? You know, it's interesting because, uh, the woman who owned it before me, um, you know, I love she, that it was another woman. Just yeah, it was. Yeah. Angelique. Uh, she had kind of, sl- she, she got very busy in her personal life and I think had kind of fallen out of love with it. So, you know, you know, after the first, you know, two or three years, I didn't really even see her at, at the meetings anymore. And um, so I was actually had been running the thing as if it were my own. So I took extreme ownership of that thing and would just yeah. drop off the checks, you know, over at her house. And, you know, but it it um, it helped me cut my teeth on my presentation skills. It ha- helped me cut my teeth on my network um, and just really building out my entire business. So. Um, I was already running it before she said, Hey, I'm going to just totally do something else. And and she asked me if I wanted to buy it. And it was since I had already been operating it, you know, for almost five years before. Right. It was just like, you know, it was just a make versus buy decision. Right. So I could have remade it. I had the list of all the, all of the members, but it already had presence. It already had, you know, a kind of an online uh, networking uh, platform, right. That we were using. Um, so it already had a couple of things that were a part of it that we had sort of uh, also grown over that time. So it just made sense. It wasn't a it wasn't a large amount of money, but you know we took it and we just used that same kind of those same fi- foundational um, pieces to be able to build it into the other cities and grow networks uh, all throughout Texas. So um, yeah, I'd say it was the foundation of my success as a real estate investor, and I think. Um, for many, that's where they get their footing, right? That's where they get that tribal knowledge, which I think is so, you know, in a world where, you know, you know, the internet knows everything, right? You can get anything in a podcast or a YouTube show. Yes. The problem is there's a fair amount of ridiculousness and it's just like sprinkled in and you just don't know which way is right. Or you get, yep. you get, you know, pieces, you know, but you don't get the entire, uh, you don't get the entire plan, right? So yeah. it's like, you know, you can you can go a couple of feet forward and then it's like, there's a skip between here and here. So it's like, and now what? Yeah, so yeah. we provide a lot of the, and now what? So. That's awesome. Well, and yeah. I think something like you mentioned, there's, you can find anything on the internet, yes. But I think a lot of it comes from people who, you know, d- do not have that full cycle experience that may have ridden the wave of the last 10 years and gotten super lucky and become these experts when now it's, we're really going to see who the experts are. You yeah. know, we're going to see who can survive the next like five years um, doing what they're what they have been doing, or if they, you know, choose to adjust. So I love that you, you know, I, that's something that gravity, I feel like probably a lot of people you've been through it. You, you know, are real about it. You, you say, you know, it's not just all rainbows and butterflies. Um, (laughs) so, well, I mean, if someone was interested in connecting with you or reaching out, how can they find you? Yeah. So, uh, Texas Rias, R E I A S.com. Uh, Texas Rias, R E A I S dot com. So <laughs> that's uh, how you can find me and just know where I am, know where we're talking, know where we're presenting. Uh, we have a, you know, obviously, I'd say 90% of our members are in Texas, but we have at least 10% that are in, you know, other states who, who, who understand um, the, the demographics that are creating so much opportunity in Texas that they want to invest here. They want to be diversified here. Right. So, uh, so yeah, no matter, no matter where you are, if you're investing in Texas, I can help you. If you're investing in other States, I'm not going to be able to, I'm not, I'm not the one. You, you know, I give you general you know. stuff, but I can't give you those local, uh, yeah. you know, boots on the ground. So, um, that is, you know, there's, there's a beautiful saying there are riches and niches and Texas is my niche. So yeah. 
I love that. Well, it was so great having you on. Good today. to connect with you again. Yeah. yeah, good to connect with you again. And thank you so much for having me. So, yeah, of course. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today on this episode of the CWS podcast. If you enjoyed the show, share it with a friend, subscribe, or leave us a review. Until next time, bye. Thank you for joining Lauren and I on this episode of the Creating Wealth Simplified podcast. Each week, we bring you expert education, experience, and information in a digestible format to help you identify investment opportunities so you can build wealth through real estate and take action toward your financial goals. Enjoy the show, share with a friend or subscribe to the show, and leave us a review. 